anyone can unmute themselves when they want to uh, speak. I think we've lost, uh, I think it's Steve. Yeah. We'll, we'll just, just wait, wait for, for a couple more minutes. minutes. Yeah. We're in the same room. So, um... Sarah, can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly, Steve. I think the mics were were um, disabled earlier, so they've oh, been great. enabled for everyone now. <laughs> great, thank you. <laughs> no worries, Steve. Thank you. So we can um, wish for another minute, probably, uh, to allow people to join in and then we can uh, start. I think we'll just make a start to respect those who have been here on time. So thank you so much, everyone, and welcome to this second webinar um, of this project. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Sara Abdalas, and I am one of the principal investigators in this uh, project, alongside my colleagues, Dr. Mike Brigby, Dr. Steve Williams, and uh, our colleague, Melanie Wachstrom. So um, welcome, everyone, and thank you for making the time today to join our webinar. So this is related to the project that is titled Working Together in Civil Society, Collaborations Between Civil Society Organisations and Trade Unions. Um, and it is uh, going to be presenting some uh, results from the um, interview phase that we have had. So just to give you a little bit of an overview in case you didn't know the full picture. So this project is going to be or has been investigating collaboration between civil society organisations and trade unions. And the key aim of the project was to uh, ascertain or find out what makes collaboration effective um, and find finding some ways of improving collaboration between civil society organisations and trade unions. So the research has been funded in part by a grant from the British Academy, and it is a collaborative pro project between uh, London South Bank University and the University of Portsmouth. So um, moving on to a timeline of activities so far. So we will be, um, first of all, looking at how historically the project has developed. Uh, but overall, if I may, the presentation is going to start with a timeline, giving you a little bit of an overview of what cases we have investigated, what interviews we've conducted, and then I'm going to hand over to my colleagues to um, take us through the guidelines that we have developed. These are in a uh, draft phase, if I may interim phase. So we have already circulated the uh, report uh, with these guidelines and these the feedback from the session today will be um, taken into consideration and will form part of the final guidelines that we're going to circulate afterwards to all the um, participants. So um, 
the project started in at the end of 22, 23, where we have conducted preliminary interviews with key informants and stakeholders from both trade unions and civil society. And the findings from those preliminary interviews informed the questions um, that we had developed into a survey. And we developed two surveys, one for trade unions and one for civil society organisations. And that survey was conducted um, from November 23 to February 24. We have uh, put a report together from that survey, which some of you have already uh, had sight of. Uh, it was circulated alongside the interim findings from the uh, from the interviews as well. So that report was initially uh, drafted and um, disseminated in March 24. Then we had a webinar, and some of you have also participated in that first webinar, which examined the cases of collaboration um, from those um, findings from the survey. Uh, and today is our second webinar following on from the interview phase. And thank you so much for all of you who have participated in that and for all the valuable information that we that you shared with ourselves. So um, the next step, as I mentioned, will be finalisation of the final report and circulation uh, for comments um, in November 24, so next month. So some of the cases that we have looked at are 12 cases. So we've identified actually many more cases from the interviews, which was really, really great to see. However, due to the limitation of time and resources, we focused on these 12 cases. Um, and then you can have a look at them. Hopefully it's big enough for you all to see, but this will all be shared afterwards as well, if you want to have a, a more detailed look at which cases we've looked at. These were the interviews that we carried out and uh, we aim to carry interviews with all those who were identified in these cases. In some instances, we tried to interview both parties in the collaboration. Uh, it wasn't always possible, but we've tried to do that as much as we could. Now I'm going to hand over to my colleague Steve to go over um, the first set of guidelines that we have developed for effective collaboration. Over to you, Steve. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you for introducing the research and the webinar. The pur yeah, the main purpose, um, as Sarah has already indicated, of this webinar is to uh, is to present the key guidelines for effective collaboration, which we've derived um, from the most recent stage of the research involving the cases of collaboration um, involving interviews uh, and documentary and some, some documentary analysis that Sarah has mentioned. And what we've been able to do is to identify 14 um, guidelines for effective co collaboration. And so the heart um, of this webinar, the centerpiece of this webinar, if you like, are uh, to present um, these guidelines to you, to talk about them, to discuss them, uh, to invite your feedback and uh, and dialogue um, as, as as appropriate on these guidelines, which appear in the interim report, which has been circulated. But just in terms of taking you through um, the guidelines in turn, as I say, we identified 14 guidelines. And the first of these guidelines concerns the form of collaboration. You know, what's the appropriate form of collaboration that makes between trade unions and civil society organisations that makes collaboration effective. Um, collaboration and can be on, a, on an ad hoc, one-off basis, or it can be more ongoing. There's the co collaboration can be can take the form of coalitions, or it can be more discreet in nature, in the form of, um, in the form of uh, in the form of uh, collaborations between individual actors. Collaboration can also be explicit, but it can also be implicit as well. Sometimes organisations might not to, might not wish to publicise um, the fact that they're in coalition uh, with one of the other actors. So one key thing that unions and civil society organisations need to consider when it comes to effective collaboration is the appropriate form of collaboration. A second key 
uh, a second guideline that we've derived in terms of understanding effective collaboration between civil society organizations and trade unions concerns the origins and development of the collaboration and the importance of recognizing recognizing and adapting to the organic basis of collaboration. Collaboration often arises through the development of shared understandings um, between key personnel. It's often opportunistic um, in that respect. Collaboration often occurs spontaneous, spontaneously. Um, so one of the things I think that uh, is important in understanding effective collaboration between civil society organisations and trade unions is to recognise that organic, that organic basis of, 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 of collaboration and the fact it often happens in an opportunistic, spontaneous way. Thirdly, one thing that became, was very important from the research and it forms the basis of the next guideline for effective collaboration concerns the importance of relationships that central to effective collaboration we found was the building and sustaining of effective relationships between key individuals from the from the trade union and the civil society civil society organization respectively key personnel key individuals who can draw upon their past experience um, and past and and the relationships they've developed in enabling them to forge effective collaborations. I think the key thing to bear in mind here is the interest and enthusiasm of individual personnel are key to developing effective collaborations. And one of the key implications of this is the importance of ensuring that the benefits of collaboration are institutionalized um, so that when individuals leave or um, or, 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 or they move to other roles, that the benefits of collaboration can be sustained. And the fourth key guideline for effective collaboration between civil society organisations and trade unions that we identified concerns the role of knowledge and particularly the effective role of knowledge in building and sustaining and building and sustaining collaboration. The fourth key ingredient of effective coll collaboration concerns the importance of making good use of organisational and individual knowledge and sharing that knowledge as appropriate. For civil society organisations, this can draw on trade unions' knowledge of the issues and concerns that face working people in the workplace and through their working lives in organisations. For trade unions, this can involve drawing on the expertise and knowledge that civil society organisations have in respect of specific policy areas um, and specific and, and their, the organisational capabilities they have um, as a result. So, so knowledge is central and the sharing of knowledge is, 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 an, is a key to effective collaboration between trade unions and, collab and, and civil society organisations. Now, as I said earlier, there's been the opportunity to um, contribute, engage in dialogue, ask questions, raise any issues um, and insights from your own experience. But just to break up the guidelines, it's all, uh, we provide an opportunity here for any anything that participants wish to add um, and some questions um, which relate based on some questions which relate to the guidelines we prevent pre prevent presented already. How does the form of collaboration between unions and civil society organisations influence its effectiveness? How can effective collaborations be developed? How far does effective collaboration depend on personal relationships? And how important is mutual knowledge sharing to effective collaboration? If any participants wish to add anything um, in response to those questions, then feel free to do so. We'd be, we'd be delighted to hear your, to, to your, to your views and insights. Um, can I can I say something? Yeah, yeah, by all means. Sorry, I can't see yeah. your name. Sorry. <laughs> um, so Deborah Laid, I'm the Seafarers Charity. Um, we've been working with a, a, um, a two different trade unions and our government uh, departments actually on some tricky um, human slavery and trafficking issues. And um, your question: How far does effective collaboration depend on personal relationships? Um, is something that I've already thought actually that's a really good point because when we have had we've had a, a, a big group of all you know organizations and departments involved 
But we do miss if that one particular person who has been involved from the beginning, for example, does not turn up. So um, you've given me an action point really here at our next meeting to actually talk about how we can institutionalise it and what that looks like so that, you know, we're almost part of the induction plan should a staff member move on, that this is a connection. And um, yeah, so those are my comments. Yeah, thank you very much, Deborah, for that in, for that for that for that insight. And we're glad you've already found something useful from this exercise. Yeah, yeah. Are there any other thoughts from participants relating to that, or any of the other questions or, or topics that we've covered already in the guidelines? If there aren't, there'll be the opportunity to to offer any further insights um, and comments late and feedback later on. If there isn't anything else to add now, if if we move on to the next slide, that would be great. Thank you. Um, and the purpose of this slide now is to present the next the next five of our fourteen um, guide fourteen guidelines. So I think the first of these relating to in in, in many ways relating to, to knowledge. I can see somebody with a hand up. Is that? I don't know who it is. There's a hand up on the screen, but uh, does anybody want to say anything? So it's, it, my, my name's um, Richard Angel from the Terence Higgins Trust. And um, I'm just coming back on the previous point. Sorry, there's a delay on my phone. The, um, okay. It isn't part of the issue is that the scale of both the voluntary sector and the trade union sector is it's all going to be about personal relationships. It's that you know, they, they aren't <laughs> yeah. great institutions of massive size. It all comes down to individuals and some of these. That's the nature of things. They come down to those kind of as much as you can put them in a work program as much as possible they're mm, they're often mm. about personal passions and we're it's two sectors that are vastly under resourced yeah, the work yeah. That they're doing and having to be yeah. quite chippy in their approach for doing it you know often if if this was a if this was a session on collaboration between the the, the corporate sector and uh, the not-for-profit sector you you almost there's a kind of assumption that one side's got money and the other side's got expertise time and passion or whatever and it, you know the, the partnership is the mm, bringing together mm. of those two things but often this is a two organizations that work in a, a a kind of aligned space but in an under-resourced way trying to eke out the resources to do something uh, collaboratively where there's often quite different cultures in how you make change you know a charity's theory of change and a trade union's theory of change are often um quite different and occasionally i imagine at odds in terms of doing that so there's okay. a yeah i think that's more they were my reflections if that's helpful yeah thank you richard sorry for some, i don't know what but maybe it's just my system but i can't see people's names so uh, colleagues names but um thank you for that richard i thought i thought there were a number of um key key points that really gel with some of the research the research that we found i think your your point about collaboration often reflecting personal passions it, you know, chimes very effect chimes very clearly with the research that we've und we've we've undertaken. Um, and the two other points you mentioned are things we will come back to in the course of these guidelines. I think, yeah, the the nature of resources, the under resourced basis of uh, the organisations concerned, and how that can be a challenge for effective collaboration. And also the different, the, you know, the different theories of change and um, and the potential clash that can ex exist between, you know, trade unions and civil society organisations' approach to securing change can 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 be a can be a challenge as well. And effective collaboration needs to recognise those differences and overcome them. But I think, and I think that's something we'll pick up on later on in this webinar. But thanks, thanks, Richard. That's really, really, really useful. Thank you. Okay, moving on to moving on to. Um, data then. I mean, this is very much linked to knowledge and knowledge sharing, of course, but it concerns the importance of, to effective collaboration of having a strong evidence base backed by data. Um, appropriate data and information is a key resource which increases the credibility of those involved in offering collaborations. The availability of you know, data on um, on, uh, on, on, for example, the impact of legislation, for example, future trends such as climate change and other features of uh, the topic where the collaboration occurs is central is central to effective collaboration. So, you know, the importance to effective collaboration, effective collaboration, being able to use data in support of knowledge sharing 
um, is one of the key things that we found from our from our research. Effective collaboration also de depends on legitimacy as well, the six of our key guidelines. It, effective collaboration relies on civil society organizations and trade unions recognizing mutually each other's legitimacy based on based on shared interest in promoting economic, social, climate justice, but at the same time recognizing that there may be different ways of they may have different approaches or different um different different uh, models of achieving that it's about the mutual recognition of the legitimacy of the other side and i think generally each party the civil society organizations and trade unions they gain their legitimacy and collaboration from different sources for trade unions legitimacy of collaboration comes as the representatives of working people working in organizations and the unions are represent and articulate their those interests for civil society organizations Legitimacy can generally comes from the extent to which they act on, um, uh, act on or represent a particular client base or from the concerns of campaigners and activists. And also linking back to knowledge from the expertise that they have in a particular particular area. The seventh key guideline that we identified when it comes to effective collaboration concerns, polit you know, concerns the political nature of collaboration and the importance in, collab in collaborations of recognizing the politicized basis of effective co collaboration centered upon demands for greater economic, social and climate and climate and climate climate justice. The emphasis placed by civil society organizations on the one hand and trade unions on the other hand um, on political leverage can vary, however. Uh, trade unions typically use their established connections within the Labour movement, including within the Labour Party, where relevant, um, to secure political leverage. Civil society organisations typically focus on mobilising supporters and engaging directly um, with policy makers. So it's important to recognise the varied ways in which unions and civil society organisations um, can exercise political leverage, while at the same time, are under, yeah, appreciating the politicized nature of, um, of, of, of collaboration. I think one other thing I'd add to this actually is that there's a strong sense from the research, particularly from civil society organizations, colleagues in civil society organizations, that some unions are more open to collaboration than others, that unions vary in their political structure and political culture and that civil society organizations can sometimes be wary of the perceived conservatism and defensiveness of unions and so there can be a potential clash of interest there which might touch on what Richard talked about earlier about the different models of change um, imbued by civil society organizations and trade unions respectively so there can be a there can be an there can be a there can, there can be a concern sometimes on the part of civil society organisations that trade unions are too conservative, um, too defensive. This links to the eighth guideline, which concerns the importance of interests. I think one of the one of the shared one of the shared shared features of collaboration between unions and civil society organisations is an understanding that it's about that the, 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 the clients, working people, people who are disadvantaged. Um, people who lack privileged position in society, their interests should be at the forefront of collaborate forefront of collaboration. But it's also about recognizing the recognizing the other parties um, concerned with promoting those interests. Um, effective collaboration um, is predicated on the imperative of recognizing that working people and clients are effectively are effectively privileged. Um, working with CSOs. Um, trade unions are better placed to support um, and advocate for vulnerable or marginalised workers as well. Workers who might previously have been neglected by traditional trade unions. So one of the key advantages um, of collaborating with civil society organisations for trade unions is that they can it can provide unions access to workers from to for, to vulnerable workers, workers from disadvantaged communities whose interests. Um, traditionally may not have been sufficiently prioritised 
by a trade union movement that, as I've indicated, can be regarded sometimes as rather defensive or rather conservative. And the tense uh, guideline that we derived for effective collaboration from the research concerns the importance of the identify concerns the importance of identifying and agree, agreeing on the methods to be used in that collaboration. The methods can vary: campaigning, policy development, publications, uh, sharing of sharing of knowledge, sh sh sharing of knowledge, um, mobilizing mobilizing activists. But one key one key factor underlies um, all of that, irrespective of the specific method, method of collaboration concerned, with the importance of joint agreements between the parties on how, how the collaboration should function, and what method it should use to advance the purpose of that collaboration. But at this point, there's an opportunity as well, if co colleagues and participants wish to take it, to reflect on um, some of the issues and themes that I've talked about on, on this slide. How can data be used for the purpose of effective collaboration? What things influence the legitimacy of collaboration in your experience? Is effective collaboration necessarily politicised? How far does effective collaboration depend on a shared belief in upholding the interests of working people? And in your experience, what methods are associated with effective collaboration? between trade unions and civil society organisations. Is there anybody who wants to share any uh, a comment on that or, or share any insights uh, or feedback in relation to any of these topics? But I've got a hand up, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I can't see who it is for some reason, but so thank Hi, you. Um, well, three, yeah. ha three hands up. <laughs> oh, OK, you. so sort of in, uh, helpefully it gives us numbers so we know which order we're in. Um, I'm Paul Day <laughs> from the Pharmacists Trade Union. Um, I think in diagrams and models, I don't think in lists. So in my head, I'm going through this. And in classic business model, um, I feel like there's a two by two grid I need to create in my brain. And, and to me, it seems there is two dimensions to this. There is the degree to which there are shared objectives between uh, the union and the CSO organisation regarding the, the topic in question. And there are there is a degree to which that is a shared priority for the organisations in question. So, for example, we have and we feature anonymously in the in the report, w w there is a benevolent fund for pharmacists. I happen to be a trustee of it as well. But, you know, its focus is on the well-being of pharmacists. That's absolutely our focus. Absolutely a shared objective. High priority. We have a formal arrangement with them by which we support them with a pound a member per year and we do bits and pieces. Um, access to um, free prescriptions for people with long term health issues is a high uh, shared objective for us and numerous charities, some of whom I note are on the call, but it's not our top priority. So it's not our shared priority. It might be medium priority for those people because they might be more about care and and um, and, uh, you know, solutions for the for the conditions concerned cures, perhaps. But I, I feel like. I feel like somehow in my head I'm 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 modelling. There's a degree of kind of, you know, we, we, you know, we're a pharmacist trade union. We we care about refugee rights, but it's but it's not our core priority. Yeah, it's yeah. not our core objective. So we might you know we might work on a very light touch, not an agreement. Perhaps come and speak to one of our networks on equality about stuff. Versus where there's absolute matching of those two those two dimensions yeah. formal yeah. agreement and you know financial arrangements whatever it might be so I, I feel like you know someone who's cleverer than me might be able to model that oh thank, thank you Paul I love two by two so oh. the, that's giving me I'm making you're making a note there that sounds like yeah because they do very much illustrate <laughs> issues yeah so I've made a note of that Paul that's a, that's a very useful insight thank you good and a second second uh question yep yeah. Uh, yeah. So first off, to echo everything Paul said, completely agree. And I'm one of the so I'm Joe Co, and I'm from the charity Pancreatic Cancer Action. Um, but I also am a active member of Unison and sit on their community and voluntary sector uh, national committee. Uh, so I often come with it with two different things. But yeah, to echo Paul's point around the competing priorities, I wanted to touch upon the question around um, interests and the importance of upholding interest of working people and clients and how important that is to collaboration but then also that relationship aspect of it and one of the things I don't think we've talked about is at what level that relationship is 
So if you're talking about a national partnership or a national relationship, that is very different from when working with a lot of the bigger unions at the regional level. And I'll give an example of when I worked for a homeless charity, I was able to use my personal connections within the movement to start within the, yeah, with the within the movement to establish a relate formal relationship between a regional office and my charity is a regional office. Now, the values of my charity's leadership weren't necessarily those of the trade union movement. They weren't necessarily people who supported recognition, but the cause and the people in the regions was something they could come together. But that relationship was never able to be grown mm. outside of that region. So I think there is something there around when we're working, and especially again, even branch levels, where yeah. unions and civil society organisations can have very effective local relationships that are delivering significant change. But if there's not a openness to trade unions within an employer, and we know that across the voluntary sector, there isn't necessarily a lot of openness to that, um, mm. then that can be a barrier for extrapolating that out. Um, and just on that, the only other thing I'll say is I think there is a sort of fundamental lack of understanding of what trade unions are across the voluntary sector and what they're there for. As someone who spent my career in the voluntary sector and is now chief executive of a charity, when I meet with my fellow chief executives, they often don't understand what trade unions do. They still have this 1980s Arthur Scargill mentality. <laughs> And so it's a really interesting, and that I find is a barrier from the civil society side to that collaboration because they don't think they share each other's interests. Yeah, thank you, Joe. And that point about understanding and mutual understanding is going to be the next gu it's going to be the next guideline. So I won't, I won't, I won't. I think I think entirely. Yeah, we that's something we have picked up on in the research, and I won't um, take, I won't get in the way of my, Mike's Mike Rigby going to present about that. But yeah, Joe, I. Pre that's, that's such a really good insight. We'll come back to that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, somebody else wanted to... Yeah, we've got more people. Number one. Yeah, sorry, I don't know. Can I just name, quickly sorry. kind of come back on that in that Joe's right about Unison's example, but there are some unions that do take a 1980s view. And I, I know a charity chief exec was told by the union regional officer, I'll close your charity down if, if you don't give me what I want type stuff. So, you know, it's yeah. not... Unison yeah. take a different approach, but Unison yeah. are are not necessarily. Yeah, you know, they don't. They don't speak on behalf of all unions. There is a spectrum of approaches that are taken by different unions. Yeah, and yeah. you know the, the the examples of those who might be more militant or assertive or what. I, I, not that Unison aren't assertive. They're very good at what they do. They just do it in a different way and understand there's a. A mutual interest type thing anyway they're, oh. they're, but i think you can't say that there is there is not one approach no, no that's right. there is actually a multitude of approaches i think we should acknowledge that simultaneously yeah i, th I think that's absolutely right and i hinted at that earlier when i talked about the the frustration that sometimes civil society organizations experience when they when they come against what they perceive as the defense the, the, the conservative with a small c conservatism of uh they experience in some unions and the unwillingness of unions to move beyond some some unions to move beyond the kind of established traditional way of uh, organizing and, and operating and viewing the, and viewing the world trying to change the world and i think that's such an important point yeah but of course unions there and, and linked to that unions vary extensively and that's such a key key insight yeah uh, so yeah, I've got one, two, and three. More, 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 more hands up. Yeah. So I don't know any of your names. So Hi, I'm... my name. I'm on number one. My name is yeah, Jane, one. and Thanks, and Jane. I'm the chief exec um, at Working Families. Um, one of one of the challenges we have is that we provide free legal advice for working parents, particularly around issues to do with family, flexible working, maternity leave paternity leave, all of those kinds of issues. Mm. And th what we have developed as an organisation, and I am not an employment solicitor, so this is not me, but what the team has developed is extraordinarily in-depth advice. Yeah. We also work with employers um, and help them create 
flexible and family friendly workplaces. That's our line. Mm. And of course, what's fantastic for us is the money that we get from employers is unrestricted. So helps mm. prop up the um, free advice that we give. There are a number of organisations in our space. So there's Maternity Action who do very similar work to what we do. But uh, what I don't, what I really struggle to do is to get unions to understand that we can help them. <laughs> mm. um, you know, we can provide that really in-depth advice about a particular thing. But our focus mm. is is always on helping people stay in their jobs because that's what they tell us they want. Um, and we have a focus on working with people with least access to justice. And what we've found is because we're small, is that collaboration can be really challenging in this mm. space. But we do absolutely have a shared belief in upholding the interests of working people. Mm. So there's mm. a, I don't quite understand how to get around that tension that we have. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I, yeah, yes. And, uh, and I, and I think that's a, I think that's such an important point about this. You've got shared shared interests, but there's uh, how you achieve those interests and the, the tools and techniques you use to 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 accomplish them to might might, be, might vary. Not unionized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, that's a yeah. That's a point that's come up in this set. That, um, uh, not necessarily so much in this piece of research, but more generally in research on civil society organisations, is that is that sometimes there can be a a reluctance to engage and collaborate with trade unions simply because most workers work in organizations which aren't unionized so if you if as a if as a charity or a, a campaigning organization you're wanting to achieve change then then collaborating with trade unions might not necessarily be such a such an effective use of your limited resources um so i think that's a really good point important point jane yeah thank you jane um so number one on the hand up yeah Hi, I'm Judith from Maternity Action. This isn't really, I wasn't going to speak about what Jane just referred to, but it, I think it does take us back actually to a statement that was made very early on before we were sort of having a discussion about the balance of resources between, and, and a comment was made that if we're talking about the corporate sector and, and very small charities, we can see the balance. I think that does apply um, to, to charities such as Jane's and ours that are small mm. and actually collaborating with mm. unions will often mean that they have to bring more of the resources to bear and I think recognition of that I think that's covered and actually I think the guidelines are very comprehensive and I I was really going to come back to what Paul was saying earlier about this sort of intersectional nature of that you know sometimes your decision to collaborate is based on several of these some of which might be more important yeah. to one partner and some to the yeah. other and I think it's really what I find quite interesting and maybe it's just a personal interest of mine is how uh, people can come together, organisations and unions can come together over something that if you think of a Venn diagram, actually, we might have a very, very small area of overlap in terms of our interests, but the opportunistic um, element of responding to, to yeah. a government consultation, I, I suspect yeah. your yeah. the top one of your collaborative partnerships fed, fell into that, the Royal National Institute for Blind People and the Railway Workers Union around you know, they might have had different reasons for opposing a particular yeah. policy, but your your shared area is sufficient to think it's beneficial to collaborate. And so I just wanted to make that point that it depends what it is you're working on that that will necessitate a bigger overlap or it's more, you know, if you're doing a, a, a consultation response together to a government consultation, that can be a collaboration that's just on that one issue, you know, and you're just bringing your own expertise to bear so it yeah it just depends i think but great thank, guidance thank, really comprehensive thanks very much judith and i think your your insight there you know it it, it um it reflects what i think paul it was paul earlier he mentioned talked about the, developing a two by two uh matrix there might be worth some way of refining that i think he, he may, may well he's added a comment on that in the they, they've added comment on that in the box so there may well be a uh, well, may well be uh, maybe may, maybe we're re further refining some kind of two by two or some kind of model uh, of collaboration here. Thanks very much, Judith. That's really 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 useful. And one one final hand up. Thank you. Hi. Uh, yeah. So uh, I'm Fran from Usdor. So slightly different perspective. I'm possibly I feel like I'm the only union on the call. Um, but it's um, 
yeah, it was. I just, I, I totally agree with what other uh, other people have said. Um, I think, um, I, like, I agree that there there are many, many different part. I think part of the challenge that you will have making these guidelines is there just isn't a one size fits all. There's like all the yeah. unions are different, and all the projects are yeah. completely different. Yeah. So it's yeah. quite hard to do guidelines when it's just like this could be anything. Um, yeah. But from Usdor's perspective, um, you know, we we do like to collaborate um, with um, charities. I think we do possibly do already do some of maternity action, but for this purpose of this, it was with child um, child poverty action. Um, um, but I was I was glad to see that um, politics was put on there as one of the sort of points of note um, for the guidelines because I do think it's something that we found that we have had to be quite careful about. In the past, I think even when we've been um, working with organisations who are very clearly politically aligned to the trade union movement and to us, um, that there's sometimes a bit of a reluctancy mm. over the kind of perceived joint campaigning and that it becomes a bit more kind of big P political rather than small P political for some organisations. Yeah, yeah. And I think that can be a bit of a kind of put off um, for some for some organisations if they don't yeah. want to be sort of um, I, like I appreciate the comments made about sort of, there are still lots of options and views about what trade unions might be bringing to the table and this kind of um, the idea of, of what you're kind of getting into bed with <laughs> when, mm. you, when you join forces with the trade unions. So um, I think it, it, I, I think it's absolutely right that you guys have, have put politics as something that needs to be considered and also discussed at an early point. I think when embarking in new collaborations, mm. I think just kind of laying that out the table so from the perspective of the union that i work for obviously we're affiliated in the low party but mm. our politics aren't perhaps as um, forthright um, as some of, of the other unions <laughs> um so that i think it's 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 worthwhile i think sort of making sort of putting that out there and, and discussing those um, right from the outset um, when embarking on collaborations just to make sure that um, yeah thank you very much sam so really, sorry yeah. No, no, no. Thank you very much, Sam. Some really important insights there about the politicised dimension of collaboration, the the variability, and uh, and and something we found from the research that there can be a a reluctance sometimes from all, from civil society organisations to engage too heavily with trade unions because of uh, anxiety um, over the you know, large piece politicised nature of some trade trade union activity. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for your comments and um, insights derived from that part of the presentation. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Mike Rigby, now, who's going to present the final set of guidelines and then invite further discussion, dialogue um, and feedback arising from that. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, I want to just focus on the uh, last five guidelines. Um, I think some of them were quite interesting because they were raised in the first webinar as well. Um, one of the features of the mutual understanding guideline, um, which Joe has referred, Joe Cohen has referred to earlier on today as well, is sometimes CSOs don't understand the nuances of trade union structure, decision making, how representative positions are arrived at, etc. Um, the strength of trade unions very much is, is the fact that the policies and positions they take is a result of these processes. And I think that that's that's something that uh, they have to communicate. Charities are collaborating with unions are often in a much stronger position in the collaboration because the union does have that democratic support, support from a lot of members. So in, in a way, having the patience for unions to go through those processes is actually strengthening the collaboration at the end of the day. But I would like to suggest that on the evidence of the research, um, unions don't always understand CSOs either. Um, CSOs are not necessarily uncomplex. They have a variety of stakeholders that they have to refer to and have to bear in mind. Um, obviously, Fund, funding agents are, are a key one, whether it's the government or some other organisation. But there are also other stakeholders. There are donors, there are volunteers, there are trustees. 
And for collaborations to be successful, the CSOs often have to square collaborations with that group of stakeholders. It's not simply a question of decision making uh, by particular people, particular groups within the officer group of the CSO itself. So both types of organisation have the complexities and understanding that and having the patience to recognise that the collaboration is going to be stronger if those complexities are allowed to play out. That, I think, is, is, is a key guideline that we came across in the interview data. Uh, collective bargaining. Um, when we started the research, we were obviously sensitive to the fact that increasing numbers of CSOs have become organised in recent years. And we wondered whether there was any evidence that any kind of collective bargaining relationship, not necessarily conflictual, but areas of sensitivity might result in collaboration being more difficult in those organisations. I think it's positive to report that we didn't really, quite a few of the organisations where we did interviews were organised. We didn't really find the existing uh, existence of union organisation um, within those uh, CSOs to be a, a difficulty which in any sense impeded or made more pr problematic the process of collaboration. What we did find reasonably consistently is having some kind of role separation between the actors involved in the two areas, collaboration and collective bargaining, was actually quite useful. Um, in the CSOs, this tended to be the difference between the policy officer, the policy function that was very often involved in campaigning and other forms of collaboration, and the HR role, which was more likely to be the lead role in terms of collective bargaining. And in the unions where we did interviews, again, the policy officer seemed to have, in terms of collaboration and campaigning in particular, a major role. So that kind of role separation seemed to us to be a useful uh, mechanism for avoiding any sensitivity between collective bargaining and collaboration in general. Um, resources, obviously the key resource is time and time was continually put forward as the kind of difficulties that slow down uh, the collaboration process and the activities associated with it. Um, the main issue in terms of constraints like time is of course being relatively honest and understanding them and planning ahead and how to deal with them. And I mean, most of the collaborations emphasise that the time constraint is something that had to be recognised and needed patience dealing with it. Sometimes collaborations went more slowly than anticipated because people hadn't realised uh, the resource of time was so limited on the other side, so to speak. So being quite explicit and articulating at the beginning what can be expected in terms of timing uh, seems to us a key resource issue um, to be dealt with. Obviously, within any collaboration, there are going to be quite often bigger and smaller organisations. And one of the things we've emphasised is that sometimes that has to be reflected in the allocation of resources within the collaboration, that some organisations were much smaller and that therefore less could be expected of them in terms of participation. So the resource issue, like most of these guidelines, does involve some planning beforehand and talking it through and understanding the impact it's going to have on, have on the collaboration itself. Uh, successes, very obviously, so collaborations are going to be more effective if the participants are encouraged by progress in the collaboration and achieving its objectives. Um, I mean, one of the things I think that came through in the interviews is that a lot of collaborations have end objectives, but there are also a lot of staging posts on the way to those end objectives. And it's useful to identify the staging posts that at particular points in time, you can point to progress being made by various indicators being used. 
don't put everything on the achievement of the end objective. Recognise that on the way to that objective, progress might be made in terms of changes in policy, however uh, modest they may be. Recognise that indicators of success also are the number of people involved in that campaign and the activity that they engage in. Uh, that other indicators of success are the number of organisations that um, are involved in the campaign. So use a variety of indicators to ensure that the collaboration continues and to have momentum and encourage people to participate. And finally, as far as the future is concerned, I don't think we encountered any um, collaboration which was necessarily going to end with the achievement of the initial objectives. In other words, in most cases, the participants had, as, as a result of working together and collaborating, identified areas where future collaboration might be potentially possible. Sometimes this also was part of the process of the collaboration, having an extended, expanded number of participants. As, as campaigns grew, more and more organisations came in, and this enabled new ideas of collaboration to develop in the future. So I think the message there is that at each stage of collaboration, you should be thinking not just of the immediate um, collaboration, but where it's leading to and how the, how the collaboration can be developed and extended in, into other areas. So that's a quite quick uh, go through of those remaining guidelines. Um, any immediate uh, comments there or what we are about to do, just to warn you, is we're about to move to the two main questions with which we're going to um, end the webinar. Any additional guidelines we've not gone got here would be very welcome in terms of feedback. And secondly, are there some things that we overstate? Are there some, some things that we've developed guidelines for that are not really problems? Um, I mean, th those are two general questions we'll pose at, the, pose at the end, but by all means revert to the guidelines I just went through just to see if there's any detailed points people would like to put forward. Hi, is it right to go? Sorry, I am number one, I think. Amanda here from Dimensions. Okay. I think Amanda has got her hand up. Do you Absolutely. want to go for Amanda? Yes, is that okay to go ahead? Sorry, yeah. Amanda from Dimensions, a uh, support with learning disabilities uh, and or autism. Um, I just wanted to, uh, I guess, raise on in terms of the collective bargaining, I saw that's on this this last slide. So I was interested because we do have a recognition agreement indeed with Unison. Um, and I think there is certainly benefit in terms of greater mutual understanding for these things of, of working in collaboration. Um, we find that a number of sort of almost opportunities for that. I mean, it's definitely helped by the shared interest. I totally agree with the point. Sometimes there are just topics that you naturally have such a great um, a sort of shared interest in that you would work together in any way, regardless of how collective bargaining might be going. Um, but I do think it helps our understanding. We have got, I would call it an open and constructive relationship with our recognised union. Um, and then just very sort of briefly, as I know we've been a little bit short on time, we do find that, you know, to the extent that we involve our own colleagues when we're perhaps uh, trying to influence on certain things in partnership with Unison, um, typically for higher pay, of course, and things like that for our colleagues on the front line. Uh, but we will then have our own colleagues involved in such conversations as well. So I feel that, you know, from that point of view, also when that is the basis of it, we don't uh, then collaborate with other unions, but equally um, we have found that to be, I would say, really quite beneficial for all concerned, really. I just wanted to add that. To, uh, thank you. Yes, th thanks. I mean, that, that's quite interesting because I, I think one of the first interviews we carried out in this project before we did the survey, the point was made to us by one of the union representatives that CSOs weren't taking advantage of the skills of unions 
in terms of HR, in terms of resource development and funding applications. In other words, there's, mm -hmm. there's a number of areas where unions might have something to contribute, leaving aside the whole area of collaboration and campaigning and that kind of area. Mm -hmm. Charities don't seem to, on the whole, um, begun to exploit that to any degree. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think certainly on the evidence of those that initial interview, it's an area that CSOs need, need perhaps to uh, think about whether there is, in terms of their collective bargaining partners, any ways that they can help in that yeah. kind of area. I think we've certainly found that they can. So yes, yeah. I, would, I would certainly recommend that. Yeah, thank you. Yes, there's one, one hand up, I see. That is me. Hi, thank you. Yeah, I'm conscious of time, but um, I am interested, and I think the chat kind of reflects some of it as well. Uh, I'm a lay member in Unite and represent uh, community work and not-for-profit members on the executive, and I've worked mostly in the advice sector, um, and... I'm also a trustee and I think there are a whole number of demographic shifts that kind of militate a bit against mutual understanding and I appreciate probably there isn't space here to look at how that could be done but I'd certainly agree that it would make collaboration more effective and I'm conscious that fewer trustees come from within the sector in which their organisation is working than used to and that a lot of the workforce themselves won't have had experience of trade union membership. So I, I, it just feels like there are probably some fairly quick wins in thinking about ways in which that mutual understanding, particularly around decision making and the importance of different stakeholder groups uh, could be facilitated. Thank you. Thanks, Ruth. Yes, I mean, it's quite interesting. I think there was a survey by the, supported by the Alex Ferry foundation about trustees and one of the conclusions of it was how few trustees had trade union backgrounds of any degree and, and the potential for using that particular vehicle for developing more expertise within within the CSO. Paul I think you oh yeah sorry my mic wouldn't come off um yeah I, I do think <clears throat> I do think, though, they're very separate issues. I, I think um, unions, I've been a national officer of three different unions. I mean, you know, I think unions' role in organising workers who happen to work in the not-for-profit sector is, to me, a very distant uh, topic to how unions and CSOs can work for the same outcome on objectives. And, you know, as a trade union people... Our instinct on any topic is to think, oh, who can we recruit? Mm. Who can we organise? Who can we get involved? But actually, this is I think this this topic to me is a, is about the policy. I mean, it's interesting. Um, someone said in the chat, you know, 60,000 not for profit uh, members of, of uh, Unite in the sector. But as you know, I've added to the chat, I mean, well over a million people just in charities in England and Wales, let alone those and not-for-profits who aren't charities and also add Scotland in. So actually union membership in charities appears to be below average and that is something that needs fixing. But to me, that's a very different issue to how we collaborate to end the bad things in the world or share the good things in the world. I think I think you're right, Paul. I mean, really, the comments on the way in which CSOs could take advantage of unions is an aside yes to the, to the overall issue uh, but it what was quite interesting is how little it's done okay any any others wants to put one forward yeah sorry oh, we've got the mic working yes sorry. Right. <laughs> but sorry it was uh, no, just saying incapability just just echoing really um what what paula said i think from from our perspective um, I mean, this issue for, for us there is literally got nothing to do with our our union membership. Our membership is very specifically in the private sector and, and retail. So the, for, for the union I work for, this will always be about um, campaign and policy and making sure that we are um, aligning ourselves with organisations that are, you know that work for us. Um, but I think the habitual problem 
that, that I have found um, in the union movement is, um, as, as a point earlier raised by Paul, which was that, you know, it, it, it isn't necessarily the core work of a union, of, of trade unions, and of specifically my union, to, mm -hmm. to do this kind of outreach work um, that, you know, in our case, is about kind of benefits of, of low wage people, you know, obviously, trade unions have a very specific purpose. And many people within the union movement are extremely labour focused on that purpose in quite a kind of defined way. So I think it's I, like I really welcome this report to try and, um, in a way, kind of sell the idea that um, that kind of joint working is obviously, you know, adds value to both unions and and to to CSOs. Um, because you know I think that there's still a bit of a struggle, which is why. You know the examples of it of it are fairly few and far between there's still a struggle to convince some people i suspect on both sides um, of, of the of the discussion that that it's like appropriate use of resources and that you know and that, that, that it's a worthwhile value adding um sort of approach which i think it clearly is um but i just really want to, to echo what paul has said which is i think that there's the discussion around whether or not people are in trade unions is totally important, um, but not necessarily one that we see as well, you know, part of this project. Yeah, thank you. Yes, I, mean, I, I, I think there is a danger that the researchers, having been surprised by how much collaboration they ha uncovered with the survey and with the interviews, become, become uh, so dominated by the idea of collaboration that they lose a sense of the balance within the activity of the different organisations. Um, and one always has to recognise that a union is going to have certain bread and butter key issues, which at any one time are going to dominate. And one's discussions of collaboration always have to be seen in that kind of context. So I think that's quite important. Any other questions or up for that? So I think we're reaching the final stage, which is um, the two key questions um, on this slide, um, which obviously as researchers we've associated with the project, we're very interested in. Is there anything we've left out? Any particular uh, areas of advice guidelines that we've left out are there any things that we've um, really talked up too much that they're not really problems we develop guidelines for things that are um not really as as difficult as uh, our guidelines suggesting i mean some it's a general session really for people to pitch in and add to what the interim report says Yes, I recognise we're at our two o'clock uh, limit, so we will keep this session rather very short. Got Judy's hand uh, Hi, it's a general comment really around. I think I think they're brilliant guidelines. I think they're really comprehensive and they're explained in the you know in the short description afterwards. I would just urge you at some point, and I don't know how publication is going to work more widely than the participants, but. Uh, it feels like in order to make these useful to people who haven't been participating or haven't been doing this is to make them more sort of user friendly for want of a better word, you know, to, to have a, a more simplified version of, you know, a checklist, if you like, um, for people to think about in order to be helpful to the charity sector. I think, and, and to unions, I think somebody earlier on mentioned, you know, NCVO or TUC, you know, the, the sort of, um, overarching organizations that might help with this but but i think it would need a, a almost a translation first if you understand my meaning yes thank thank you i mean i, th I think you're you're right i mean the, the the guidelines guidelines will emerge in various forms um for the british academy they'll be much more detailed but obviously we would like to produce a much more user-friendly version for users more widely. 
we've got Frank um, Hector. Sorry, I, I'm just, I'll, I'll be super quick. We're just piping up again, but I, I absolutely agree with the, the, the previous point. But, and I think it, it would be helpful if it was something that were kind of user friendly, sort of trade union focus. To I'm not sure if the thought, if it, I'm, I, I, I'm not a kind of academic person, so it might not be something that you do, but it, it, it doesn't seem to be sort of selling the idea that that collaborations are a good thing. It's more like we, you know, we looked at these collaborations and here's what we learned. But it doesn't draw the conclusion that collaboration does it draw the conclusions that collaborations are a good thing, like I, like it just the um, to kind of uh, to sort of explicitly say that a bit more I think would be welcome. Yes, we we need to be careful how we frame the whole area of collaboration. I, I think that, that that's certainly something that we need to take on board. Um, Anybody on the other side? No, no, sorry. We don't have any other questions. No, no. no. So we go to the last of the slides. Um, we're at the stage really after this uh, webinar of developing the final report. Um, this webinar will be very useful because of the individual comments that have been put forward. Um, we have to submit that firstly to our funding body, the British Academy, but we will obviously, before we send it to them, we'll circulate it um, to you for comments. I mean, what one of the things that will be different uh, between the interim and the final reports is in some cases we will mention particular organizations in giving examples of collaborations um, so it is quite important that you do look at the final draft to make sure that if we mention your organization it's not mentioned in a problematic way I mean that 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 process is very important. I think in terms of uh, finalising the report and sending it to the British Academy, and we expect to send that draft to you in the next three to four weeks. Uh, certainly before the end of November, uh, our aim is to send it to the British Academy before Christmas. We will be distributing the report as well to our, as well as to our funding body to other interesting parties. Um, to you see, for example, Paul Nowak has been very supportive in terms of the project. NCVO, um, civil, civil society ministers with it within the government and relevant media that are particularly those associated with the voluntary sector. And then we come to the um, what is in a sense the most tedious stage of the project where we as academics have to prepare academic articles for journals on the research. Um, but that that process will probably go on for about two years and I don't don't expect um, you will be all that engaged in it. Um, so the, the next step really will be receiving the draft final report from us and you looking at it to see how your particular organization's case of collaboration has been presented in it, if, if that's the case. Um, Sarah, Jen, more you wanted to, so. to thank everybody for um, yeah. their contributions, really, um, and for a very rich discussion today. So, um, yeah, that, that's it for me. Yeah, I second that. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for the attendance and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.